Okay, we're just going to give a few minutes for people or a minute or so for people to log on. So just hang on a little bit if you're on. Okay, I want to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, to today's uh, uh, discussion, which I think is going to be great. I want to welcome you all and also thank the Center for Public Leadership, which is co-sponsoring today's event along with the Ash Center. And on behalf of both the Center for Public Leadership and the Ash Center of Harvard Kennedy School, we want to start by acknowledging that the land on which Harvard sits today was originally the land of the Massachusetts people uh, and has always been for centuries a place where nations and people would meet to exchange ideas. Uh, we're gonna, here's the way we're gonna do it. I'm gonna introduce uh, Carolyn Lukensmeyer momentarily. Um, we have a big panel uh, and many, many people in the audience. And so we're gonna go through a discussion about citizen ballot initiatives and the way they have um, uh, been able to enhance democracy in many places. Uh, we're gonna have a discussion among the panelists at first, Carolyn will lead it, but there will be questions and answers later. So you have a Q and A, uh, 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 function on your uh, YouTube. So just put in your questions. And later on, Toba Wang, who's my colleague at the Ash Center, will be answer, asking the questions, et cetera. This event, I should tell you, is being recorded. It will be available on the Ash Center YouTube site uh, shortly after the event. And, um, and I also want to let you know that our next event will be on March 21st, 24th, rather. And it will be the uh, Our Common Purpose the report, extraordinary report of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences Commission on the Practice of Democratic Citizenship. Anyway, let me introduce Carolyn Lukensmeyer, who will be our host and moderator today. Uh, Carolyn and I have been friends for many, many years, and we actually call her in the democracy movement the uh, moderator extraordinaire. Uh, I first met Carolyn when she was the director, founder and director of an organization called America Speaks, which was singular in its ability to get large numbers of citizens together to discuss really, really difficult uh, and important issues. I actually attended, as did Tova, uh, an event that she did at the Javits Center in New York shortly after 9-11, in which 3,000 people discussed what should happen at the site. And Carolyn handled it as if, 5,000, Carolyn handled it as if it were uh, three people in a living room. So it was great. <laughs> anyway, re most recently, she was the director of the National Institute for Civic Discourse, uh, senator at Arizona State University, uh, and she is just uh, a leader in the civic dialogue space, and I'm proud to say that she's a friend. Carolyn, uh, we're looking forward to you leading us through this conversation today, and welcome. Thank you so much, Miles, and a huge thank you to the Ash Center and the Center for Public Leadership for sponsoring today's panel, and welcome to all of you who have joined us this afternoon. We all know American democracy is in serious trouble today. Each of you could tell a story from your own experience about just how serious this threat is. Over the last four decades, we have watched trust in American government plummet to dangerous levels. And in the last decade, we tragically have watched our trust in each other also decay almost evaporate. On January 6th, we all witnessed an insurrection on the most sacred ground of our nation's democracy, our capital. Never before in modern political history has it been so important for each and every one of us to be called on to answer the question, what can I do to ensure that this never happens again. But in the midst of this crisis and the continuing threats to our democracy, there's also very good news. All across this country, Americans of every walk of life, of every belief system, red states, blue states, purple states, all of us are seeing a resurgence of people stepping up, putting a stake in the ground, to say we can and do have agency in our democracy. We, in fact, each and every one of us can make a difference. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us 
five people from across the country who have stepped up in ways that have made a difference, actually creating structural change to strengthen our democracy. Each one of them had their own aha moment in which they said, I'm gonna put a stake in the ground. I'm gonna make a difference in what I believe I can. And you know what's most important for all of you who are listening to know? I know because I've gotten to know all five of them, that each one of them would describe themselves as ordinary Americans when they started on their journey. Our hope for you today is that their stories will inspire you to follow your passion and make a difference in our democracy. A topic, citizen ballot initiative, a new tool for election reform. Let me introduce our first panelist, Chris Melody Fields Ferro. Oh, it's Chris, I blew it. I was gonna try to roll my R. I am so sorry. Anyway, say it yourself, please, now that I've embarrassed myself. Figueredo. Thank you. I swear I had it down. Chris is gonna be speaking to us from the national perspective. She's the executive director of the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center. She's got two decades of experience in advocacy. She creates collaborative spaces and she's really all about movement building. She has devoted her career to social justice and ensuring that our democracy really works for we the people. As a queer woman of color who came to the US at an early stage age with her working class parents, she describes herself as leading from her lived experience and building an equitable and just world, which we all deserve. Take it away, Chris. Well, thank you so much, Carolyn, for that introduction. I wanna thank Miles and Tober for inviting me on this panel. And I just want us to take a breath. Like 2021 has already been a year. And we're having this conversation on the heels of the House passing the For the People Act that will make giant steps in building an inclusive and participatory democracy. But we know to make our democracy work, it isn't just up to our representatives and government. We the people play a critical role in shaping our democracy and ballot measures are our tool. At BISC, we believe that ballot measures can be a tool for liberation strengthen our democracy and transform our country if we center the communities most impacted by the change we seek. And we know that the people believe in progressive values. Since 2015, in partnership with groups on the ground all across the country, BISC has deployed a proactive strategy to build an inclusive democracy. And we're winning. Our panelists today are proof of that. Just last year, 27 proactive statewide ballot measures passed. And as we grappled with a racial reckoning after the murder of George Floyd, 19 of 20 of the local ballot measures on policing passed. Right now, after our success, we are facing relentless attacks from our opposition to limit our voices. Even after voters rejected every single ballot measure to curb direct democracy, we are tracking 86 bills in 24 states to change the ballot measure process. I'll close with this. Over 120 years ago, ballot measures were created to provide the people a tool to break the stranglehold on corporations on our state legislatures. We are again facing similar threats where our representatives and government listen more to corporations and wealthy donors than us, the people they are supposed to represent in government. And on January 6th, as Carolyn said, it just showed us how fragile our democracy is and that white supremacy is our greatest threat. And I believe that ballot measures provide us an opportunity to radically reimagine our democracy, especially for people like me who weren't intended to be included when our democracy was born. I'm so excited about this conversation and thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Our next speaker, Kara Brown McCormick, is the co-founder of the Committee for Ranked Choice Voting. She led the 2016 and 2018 ballot initiative campaigns that made Maine the first state in the country to adopt ranked choice voting. 
In Maine, that means voters can use them in statewide primaries for all races for Congress and for the presidency. Recently, Larry Diamond, a name some of you may know, he's a renowned democracy scholar at Stanford University, dedicated his most recent book to Kara. And in it called her one of the most, seven of the most important dissidents in the world today. We're very lucky to have Kara with us. Uh, first, uh, thanks, thanks, Carolyn. I wanna thank everyone at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation, and in particular, Miles Rappaport for his leadership and Dr. Carolyn Lukensmeyer for being our moderator today and for her transformative work in the field of deliberative democracy. Uh, when I began my journey to bring ranked choice voting to the state of Maine, I started with two important resources. The first was a copy of the Maine Constitution, which lays out in brilliant detail the timing and the process by which citizens can organize and make laws here. The second was Google, which led me to the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center, where I spent days and days and days going through all of the resources that Chris Melody's group has so carefully curated. There are two things that I wanted to share with all of you based on my experiences now running three statewide ballot initiative campaigns for ranked choice voting in the United States. One is that with ballot initiatives, you are truly fighting a battle, um, oftentimes with very determined adversaries that aren't necessarily who you might think that they are. So even when you're advocating for something as righteous as ranked choice voting, it is not by any stretch of the imagination a loving kumbaya sort of exercise. <laughs> State legislators and the top leaders in those legislatures do not for the most part take kindly at all to citizens stepping in to pass laws that politicians have failed to pass. They don't like sharing power with citizens in this way. Um, I believe that this is particularly true when citizens are trying to pass a law like RCV or independent redistricting, which affects the way that they are elected and able to come to power. But the good news is that in the battle for ranked choice voting anyway, it was their opposition that ended up making us stronger and more determined to win. So it was a case uh, where the obstacle was the way forward. Which leads me to my second point, which is that even when you win at the ballot box, as we did in Maine in November of 2016, you can't just go home and revel in your success. In Maine, even though question five got the second most votes of any citizens initiative in the history of the state, getting it implemented presented an entirely new challenge. In our case, the legislature called a special session in the middle of the night, they repealed our law, we had to gather another 70,000 signatures in 88 days in the middle of the winter. Our CV had to go back on the ballot and we had to win a second time before they finally got the message and the law was implemented. So even when you think you have won the battle, it is really just the beginning. Thank you very much, Kara. Our next panelist is Katie Fahey. Katie Fahey founded and led a grassroots nonpartisan campaign in 2018 that ended gerrymandering in Michigan by amending the state constitution with 61% of the vote. Take note of what the initiative as it worked was called, voters, not politicians. Because of the extreme divisiveness in politics, Katie decided to post on Facebook, asking if anyone would like to work on gerrymandering in her state. Can you imagine her surprise when she ended up with more than 10,000 volunteers who collected more than 425,000 petition signatures and didn't spend a dime? That made history in Michigan, and my guess is it probably has made history across the country. She's now the founding executive director of The People, a national organization that wants to empower ordinary Americans to find common ground and take action to create a government that is responsive and accountable to all of us. Katie. Thanks, Carolyn, and everybody on the panel. It is literally a dream come true that this is happening and that we can have this discussion today. So just thank you for your time and to the Ash Center, thank you for making this a reality. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, I'm here because I made a Facebook post 
I make plenty of social media uh, posts that do not lead to amending our state constitution, but one morning it happened to work. Um, in Michigan, I was recently out of college. Uh, I, I, my background's actually in sustainability. I worked in the grocery industry, helping figure out how do we do recycling. Um, and we had the Flint water crisis in Michigan, where because of government failure, there were literally entire communities poisoned um, and could not go to school drinking water. And I was so sick of not being able to feel like anybody was taking that seriously and doing something about it. And when I thought about what is a way that we can actually fix this problem for the long term, how do we prevent the next Flint water crisis? How do we try and make sure that our government actually can be accountable to its people so that when we see that there are flaws, we can get action that happens afterwards. Um, and that's really what, what a big part of my post is about. And to my surprise, there were thousands of other people who felt the same way. And I think for me, one of the things I hadn't realized until a bunch of other people said, oh yeah, I want to end gerrymandering too, was that I could actually do something about it. It's not that I just became mad about gerrymandering. I had been mad for years since I learned about it in like fifth grade. Um, just kind of wondering like, why, if we know this is broken, don't we do anything about it? But the aha moment really was a like, I don't have to keep waiting for somebody else to come fix it. I actually have my own power, even though I also like Kara had to Google it right away. <laughs> um, we have an ability to drive change ourselves. And so thankfully in Michigan, in our state constitution, we do have the ballot initiative process, which meant if we could write constitutional language, if we could gather 315,654 registered Michigan voter signatures in 180 days using black or blue ink, never purple, um, then we could put the ballot question up to the actual voters for them to decide. And what was really beautiful about that process is when we were even writing the constitutional language, we went across the state and we met in communities um, just asking our fellow Michiganders, what would you want in a system? And it felt like what democracy should be. I feel like we get told what democracy is and the power where, you know, different ideas can actually build a better solution than any one of us could on our own. But I hadn't seen or experienced a lot of that actually in practice throughout my, a lot of my life. But having the ability as a citizen to use a direct democracy process opened my eyes to that. And we had people of all political ideologies, all ages, some people who weren't even registered to vote because they felt like the system was rigged because of things like gerrymandering, all sitting at the table, really critically thinking about what is the solution we can design to guarantee generations of Michiganders after us will have a more fair and equitable voting process to participate in. And what's really exciting, just to end on that, is now that redistricting is happening, um, we have an independent citizens redistricting commission. There is a, a group of citizens who are now meeting, determining our election lines for the first time in Michigan history. Um, and they will the next decade too. And just watching them come together as also citizens who who knew about redistricting, but really were not experts and were quickly becoming experts. It's been a really beautiful process to see. Thank you, Katie. I'm sure all of you joined us can see the level of excitement and commitment that each of these people have experienced out of the work that they did and continue to do. I am particularly thrilled to introduce our next panelist. She comes to us from across the country. And this story is really fun. Dina Butcher's grandson's friend dubbed her badass while reading a brochure for passing measure one, which is a constitutional measure to establish an ethics panel, providing transparency and campaign funding and to better define the rules for lobbying in North Dakota. She was one of the founders of a band of what they call authentic nonpartisan badass grandmas who hit the road to all small town coffee shops, newspapers, and airwaves that handily won what is now Article 14 in a very red state, the North Dakota Constitution. This octogenarian served in several Republican administrations and retired last year from her family private investigative business. I don't know if that's legitimate to ask her questions about that later or not. But she also wanted us to know she hasn't retired from righteous indignation and mouthing off on hypocrisy. Dina, take it away. 
what she said. <laughs> I rest my case. Oh, we, uh, under the, the title of the North Dakotans for Public Integrity, a group of people who met together for over a year having coffee and discussions about what we saw was a disconnect in North Dakota, which is a relatively small state, smaller than most of your communities, actually. We have a population of a little bit over 700,000 in the good years. Now that the oil boom is having its, its cycles, it may be less than that. Um, but there was, there. I think I was really irritated because so often the saw of North Dakota is a cheap state to buy was said by powerful influences from out of state. And it was beginning to show on our legislators who as much as they are neighbors and friends, when they get to the legislature, it's like joining a club and they begin to do group think versus what's right for my constituents. So it was easy for the power brokers to come in and through the, the various leadership um, to wine and dine them, uh, to take them, send them on trips. And we were seeing this happen more and more and resulting in legislation that favored out-of-state interests versus North Dakota citizens' interests. So we decided to, to check on things and, and we were amazed at the partnerships in this democracy movement that came to our, our aid and assistance with public relations and some financial assistance. And of course, that's always what our opposition says. Oh, they're funded by out-of-state interests. In our case, it was more support in professional help than it was in actual monetary assistance. And our opposition was made up of the usual um, power brokers. And uh, indeed, the power, many of them were out of state oil interests. And in some instances, we believe foreign interests that came out against our, our initiated measure. But with a few of us that crisscrossed the state um, as badass grandmas, carrying the message that we had nothing to lose. We were not seeking office. Several of us had run for office already. I, in my case, I lost many years ago. We were Democrat, Republican, independent, not giving a damn, <laughs> some, some people, but we ran into a lot of people who were just as indignant about the disconnect on what was happening in our legislature. And they approved of what we did. And in the small towns that we went to, sampling caramel rolls and finding the best sausage across North Dakota, we had great welcome. And it and we gave these people, most of them Republicans probably in this state, we gave them permission to listen to the issues, vote for the issue. It doesn't have anything to do with your political persuasion. And that's how we were able to pass a, a constitutional measure. And by the way, we did that purposely because South Dakota had passed a similar measure on ethics and uh, dark money and had it overturned by the legislature as a statutory. So that is my caution. And we are having some difficulties with uh, having the steps taken that, that need to be taken to implement the rest of this measure, but Therein lies my longevity. I've got, I've got a few more years to go. <laughs> Dina, thank you very, very much. And our cleanup batter for this extraordinary panel is none other than Desmond Mead. And many of you who are with us today may well have seen him on national media. Desmond is the executive director of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. And he led the effort to pass Amendment 4 in Florida which restored voting rights to 1.4 million returning citizens. Desmond was named one of the 100 most influential persons by Time Magazine in 2019. He is dedicated to ending discrimination of people with prior felony convictions. And like all the rest of the panel, completely committed to creating a more inclusive democracy for all of us. Desmond. Carolyn, I don't know how I could bat clean up after a badass grandma, but <laughs> I'm going to do my best. First of all, let me just thank Ash Center, Miles, Tova Wang, uh, and the panelists on this call um, for, for being here. And those of you all who are, are looking or listening in, you know, my, my in, 
insertion into a, a ballot initiative. Really, I think God is launching when uh, in Florida at the time, you know, Florida permanently disenfranchised anybody that was convicted of a felony offense, no matter how uh, small that offense was. So a person driving with a suspended license or trespassing on a construction site or pier or even disturbing turtle nesting eggs would uh, stand the chance of losing the right to vote for life, knowing that felon disenfranchisement saw its 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 uh, roots um, during the Reconstruction era when this policy was reinvented to prevent newly freed slaves from uh, participating in our democracy. But I remember in 2011, when the governor and his cabinet in Florida decided that they wanted to make it real difficult, extremely difficult for people to be able to vote again, to participate in our democracy. And I was thinking about how four politicians had so much power to determine which American citizen get to vote and which American citizen do not get to vote. And that was entirely too much power for any politician to have in their hand, whether they're Democrat or Republican, right? And that the, the power of the vote, and, and when you talk about voting, there's nothing that speaks more to American citizenship than being able to, to vote. And, and so we knew that there was something that needed to be done. You know, we talk about how there is uh, the trust in our government is decaying, right? And so we knew that we couldn't rely on, on, on our government to make it right, that we the people, and that seems to be that common uh, a phrase, we the people actually had to come together and do that. And that's exactly what we did. But that we the people speaks more to a, a, a unity than it does to what uh, maybe some politicians or the partisan infighting has caused uh, to occur in our country with so much division and, and hatred and fear that we the people says that together we can accomplish things. And Amendment 4 set out to do just that. You know, and then when you talk about ballot initiatives, I know voting to me is the, the most important thing or display of citizenship, but a ballot initiative is right behind it because that is the one time that we, the people, can actually take matters into their own hands in spite of the politics. And we elevated our ballot initiative above partisan politics, above uh, implicit racial biases. And we found a space where people from all walks of life and all political persuasions could actually come together along the lines of humanity. And engaging in a ballot initiative whose topic was so divisive uh, in a state that was so controversial uh, during a, a period in our country uh, uh, electorally that there was so much hatred and fear and, and, and partisan uh, divide to actually successfully pass this ballot initiative was nothing short of a miracle. But I believe miracles happen and miracles can happen when we, the people, take matters into our own hands. And so on that fateful night in November of 2018, we had over 5.1 million people, over 64% of people voted yes on Amendment 4. A million more people voted yes for our initiative than any candidate on the ballot. And no 5.1 million votes, they weren't based on hate, they weren't based on fear, they weren't based on party. They were based on love, forgiveness, and redemption. And we showed the world, the state of Florida, that love, yes, that four-letter word love can win the day and it did, right? And so when we the people come together and when we connect with each other like the badass grandmas did, it didn't matter if you're conservative, it didn't matter if you're progressive because collectively we as human beings have more that binds us together than what separates us. And we can rally around that and through ballot initiatives, we could bring the full force of we the people to bear and lead with love. Thank you, Desmond. Now I know if we were in pre-COVID times and someday in post-COVID times, we would all be clapping for these five panelists, but we'll have to forego that today. I'm gonna to shift the focus now to ask a few questions following up on what you've heard from these extraordinary, ordinary citizens. And I'm gonna keep it pretty tight because we really want to take as many questions from you who've joined us as we possibly can. So panelists, I know this will be tough, 
I'm going to do a question, but please, no more than three of you respond. <laughs> Most important theme, possibly, in our challenges to democracy is the loss of trust. We're sitting at a time when 40 million, maybe more, Americans still don't even believe the election was a legitimate election, even though it was the most inclusive safe ever. So given the potentially erosion, the erosion of trust, how do you see what citizen ballot initiatives can do to begin to restore public trust in our democratic institutions? Well, I'm happy to hop in first, if that's helpful. Um, I think the beauty of citizen-led ballot initiatives is that we actually get to be in the decision-making room. To steal a line from Hamilton, the room where it happens, you can actually be a part of understanding how the process that you're rebuilding is going to be rebuilt. Um, I think especially on issues of democracy, where our elected officials have a high incentive to try and make sure the rules keep them in office. We actually have to turn to things like citizen ballot initiatives so that the motivation for wanting to change things is coming from the people who are actually impacted by it. When we as citizens can come in, actually write these laws, see the motivations for why they're being written, be a part of writing it, and then be the whole reason that it's going on the ballot and ultimately voting to accept it. I think that allows people to engage in the political process differently. And borrowing from something that Dina had mentioned, I think when you can actually talk about an issue, it gets past the high level talking points that talking heads on TV are mentioning for why, you know, Democrats want this or Republicans talk this. It's real. It's talking about our community. It's a, it's a concrete example and a specific pathway forward that we craft together. Who else would like to comment? I think one thing I would add is, you know, um, we are facing a crisis, especially for young, with young people and people of color. Um, you know, after having record tur turnout last year by people of color and young people, we are seeing what happened, what is happening right now in the state legislature of trying to undermine participation in our democracy. We at BIS did research focusing on Black, Latinx, Indigenous, API, and Gen Z millennial voters last year, um, trying to understand why ballot measures is so appealing and what it, it is. And 64.4% said essentially that they trust ballot measures more than they trust candidates. They don't see a D or an R um, when, when they see a, um, a ballot initiative, they see something that impacts their community. And especially for communities of color who, if we're being really frank, democracy was never intended to include. And we see lack of representation in government. People of color especially see that this is our tool to actually do what we need for our community. And blow up the current system, right? Like some of the most popular things um, are, ending the two-party system in the electoral college. Like people see that that actually is preventing us from having a, an inclusive and participatory democracy. So I think that is why ballot measures are so appealing to people because they see it, how it will play out in their real lives. Chris, when, when you were talking, what it reminded me of is like, we need to build institutions that are actually worthy of trust. The institutions we have right now, we don't lack trust in them because uh, we just want to lack trust in them. They're actually not worthy of our trust because they don't behave in ways that earn that and keep our trust. So the ballot initiative process allows us to actually build new institutions that can reflect the American people. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so the next question, I'm sure that people are listening to you <laughs> and see what you've accomplished. We'd love to hear, what did you find most challenging about achieving a successful citizen ballot initiative? And let's start with a couple of panelists who didn't answer the last question. Well, I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> attempt to, to speak to that, but I think locating partners who are willing to, to uh, join in with their coalition of members and others to, to get them 
agreeable to what's in there. I mean, quite often there's a piece of what you're doing that some other group might not totally agree on and coming to that co consensus and then going forward and keeping all of those good partners um, involved and knowledgeable about what's going on and active in their communities to help you spread the message. That's a real challenge, raising money. There's no question that without our national partners, we could not have carried on going forward. And I have to give a shout out to, to all. Oh, we've lost your internet connection, Dana. Let's have somebody uh, else yes. try. Yeah, try. so while we're waiting on um, Dina to come back. Um, so a couple of challenges I would like to mention. Uh, number one is really understanding that there is a difference between the sophistication of a ballot initiative and the soul of a ballot initiative, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by that is that uh, one of the challenges I felt was that, number one, typically when you have a ballot initiative, it's led by a white man. You know, and so me as an African American man and as a returning citizen, uh, actually leading a ballot initiative, that's unheard of. Maybe you could be the voice, right? Or maybe you could be the face, I mean, of a ballot initiative. But no, we, we need somebody else that's gonna uh, be able to be a, a, a better strategist, uh, a strategist, I should say. And, and in a lot of cases, the very same people uh, who bring the soul can also be a part of the strategy itself. The other thing is a reliance on operating in the same way that you've been operating before. We always talk about insanity is doing the same thing over again, expecting different results. We talk about it, but then we'll go right back and engage in that. And so one of the hardest things was how do we get people to think differently and not engage in their own version of dog whistle politics, right? thinking that we have to say things a certain way or a matter of fact, we could only talk to certain people. Right. And, and, and so we can't talk to those people because they're going to be against it. And you foreclose any opportunity to move people into your issues. You foreclose any opportunity to engage as Dana talked about engage in some real face-to-face uh, uh, -face conversations that can be so transformative. And so the reluctance to, uh, uh, um, speak to the other side uh, it was definitely a challenge, uh, but we was eventually able to break through that. And as far as uh, having people who are directly impacted at the center uh, of a ballot initiative and not just to be a face or a voice, but to be part of developing strategy, I think uh, that was a breakthrough that we was able to accomplish as well. Terrific, terrific. Kara, you wanna add anything to this? Conversation? Um, no, I'm good. Okay. I it, uh, I, I, I'll answer the next question. How about that, Carolyn? All right, that's fine. Chris or Katie, do you want to add anything about challenges? I would actually just say that the same ones Dina and Desmond mentioned, we also saw in Michigan. Um, coalition with people who are willing to do things in a new way. Uh, one of the things I really saw was that especially around the Flint water crisis, but also the 2016 election, there were so many people who are seeing the headlines. They feel a bunch of urgency and the ability to actually take that energy and use it productively and be genuinely inclusive, let people into the strategy room, let, let people help design what is the outreach program going to look like for their community because they actually live there and they know their community. We did that really well, I would say, but there was a lot of like resistance to that. And I think there was just a lot of worry that like, because this looks different, because organizing is happening more online or maybe with different people in the room that like, can we trust it? And so getting funding for that and the support for that was really hard. Um, and I hope that some of the people who are on this panel, we've helped pave the way for a new example of like, these things can work and actually they can possibly work even better. Welcome back, Dina. <laughs> Battery problems. <laughs> we, we, we all know how that happens these days. Yeah. Uh, you were in the middle of a sentence when we lost you. If you happen to remember what you wanted to say, we'd be glad to hear it. Well, I can tell you what the expletive was when, when my computer. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> Great. I, I believe I was talking about just keeping people informed and, 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 and directed towards your end goal. Of, of getting the job done. 
Um, and we were very fortunate to, to gather moss as our stone rolled <laughs> toward victory. Super. So I'm gonna ask one more question. And again, panelists feel free to comment and talk with each other. And then I'm gonna open it up for questions from those of you who've joined us. And I just wanna tell everybody who's watching, we had such a high registration today and five panelists. So we actually intend to extend the time until probably 5.10, 5.15. So if you have a question, don't feel like you won't have a chance to get it in if we're getting close to five. But the last question I'd like to ask all of you is as you did this work, what kind of discoveries, what kind of innovations did you develop that got you over the hump on some of these almost predictable challenges? So as promised, I'll answer this one, Carolyn. And, um, you know, Katie Fahey and I didn't meet until after we had both done the work that we did in our individual states. But upon meeting in, in our first conversation in our subsequent conversations, we noticed so much that she and I came up against, like our stories are so similar. Mm -hmm. the, the, the things that were difficult for us, the challenges that we faced were so similar. And the, um, that was just really an interesting part of this. And one of the things that we discovered, I think both of us is that nonpartisanship in doing a ballot initiative is um, really, really important and also just incredibly rewarding. That um, in Maine, we invited Democrats, Republicans and independents to the table. Uh, it was the first, you know, I'm a Democrat, longtime Democrat, forever Democrat, but boy, did I meet a lot of wonderful Republicans and independents working on, uh, on this campaign, on the two, di two different campaigns. And uh, so that, that was one thing that I discovered is that, is that we together agree on a lot more than we disagree on. And the ballot initiative gives us this chance to kind of leave that partisanship at the door and work together on a just a different basis. It's incredibly rewarding. And uh, I hope that um, other people had the same experience that, that I did. The other thing is, you know, campaigns are really um, usually pretty tough. Uh, and we were called upon um, many times. People said, well, why aren't you attacking, you know, our governor, Paula Page at the time? Or why aren't you attacking, you know, this one, that one, the other one by name, you know? And we decided that we would just sort of be relentlessly positive, that no matter what, we were just going to stick to saying good things. Um, you know, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Mm -hmm. That also really helped us in the end, not to vilify anyone, but just to try to work together to try to fix a broken system, to do something that was good without making anyone wrong in the process. Because with ranked choice voting in particular, we're trying to change the way that politicians behave with one another so that we take away the incentive of, uh, you know, of fighting each other and making something wrong. Like you're allowed to, with ranked choice voting, you can sort of choose your first, second and third candidate's choice without saying like, I like this one and everybody else is horrible. Um, and and so, so anyway, those are the two of the discoveries. And I feel like Katie and I both sort of discovered the same thing. Thank you, Kara. Someone else want to join in with a, a comment? Well, I think having I a sure. higher purpose to take it out of the, the realm of politics, that it wasn't, it, it, it's your authenticity of, of goals. And ours was generally to make, the, to leave a legacy for our grandchildren, leaving the democracy in a better place than what we were taking it from. And Desmond. Yep. Yeah, so a couple of things. I mean, I ditto everything that Kara and, and, and Dina said, especially Kara. Uh, that's exactly what we did. But a couple of things is that, number one, uh, uh, in recovery, one of the things I learned was kiss, right? Keep it simple, stupid, right? <laughs> and that sometimes that messaging, right, we don't have to get too complicated with it, you know? And so no matter what part of Florida I was in, you know, we would we would start the conversation by just asking a person, do you have anyone you love who has ever made a mistake? Right. And, and, and so it didn't have to be about us anymore. 
right? What we were doing was bringing the potential voter, bringing the person that was signing the petition into the conversation with uh, actually through the, 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 the ties that they have with someone uh, that they love. And then the other one, I believe, uh, and I don't know if it's an innovation, it's more of a light going on than anything, is that, man, directly impacted people can do some amazing things, right? Because when you look at over the last four years, you had a major ballot initiative win in Louisiana. That was won by uh, people who are led by uh, people who are directly impacted. Uh, just this past election cycle, Prop, I think, 17 in California uh, that extended voting rights to people on probation was won by, was led by people who are directly impacted. And so some of the biggest ballot initiative of victories over the last four years have been, look, you got Katie, people who, regular ordinary people that you don't have to have all these titles, uh, you know, behind your name in order to lead something and to be successful. But it's, it's just regular ordinary people that's bringing a level of authenticity and simplicity to a process that can be successful. So I'm going to make the shift so that we hear from some of the people who've been listening to you all. But I'm going to underline just a couple of things before we make the shift that are so critical to where we are in the country. One, you have all underlined several times the importance of these ballot initiatives being nonpartisan. Another one is the fact that we all found in our work in the National Institute for Civil Discourse that Americans have a lot more in common than are dividing them. But we're dealing with a business model in media and a political campaign model that by definition focuses on keeping us apart. So if in fact we do this kind of work, whatever the topic is, we can rest on the solid ground that if we have that simple, straightforward message, people are gonna to respond to it. So Tova Wang, uh, one of the fellows at the Ash Democracy Center is gonna pull off the questions that we've gotten either in the registration process or as people have been listening in the chat room. So Tova, please take it away. Thanks, Carolyn. And we, we do, of course, have a lot of questions. <clears throat> so you guys will have to cut me off at the appropriate time. Um, I just need to point out that um, despite the fact that we have spent a great deal of time talking about this because voting issues are so polarizing apparently and so partisan, there are a lot of people who have been asking about how the hell do you get this nonpartisan coalition behind your efforts and, and how did that work and what were the strategies? Um, I know that you've talked about that a lot. So if you have anything more to say about that, there definitely is a lot of um, uh, surprise, I guess, good surprise at the ability to do that um, and, and really big interest in how we can keep doing that. Um, so the other question now I will ask is that come up it came up in a couple of different ways is how do we increase the use of ballot initiatives on these kinds of topics um, and how do we so someone from Pennsylvania was saying that there is no opportunity to do anything by ballot initiative in Pennsylvania so what do we do about that and then a related question is and this is something that I'm very disturbed by is that there are some measures out there some legislative efforts to limit and restrict the use of ballot initiatives now that there have been these wins and how we should respond to that. I can start with this one and something that I say a lot is it, we have to liberate the tool. So yes, 120 years ago, we got the ballot measure process, but it was purposely kept from former slaver holding states and states with large black populations. That was intentional, right? Folks in, in state legislatures and in the, in the South did not want free Blacks to have the ballot measure process. They didn't want free Blacks to have a say in our political process. So I think we have to be really real about why before we even get to the question of where we expand. And be, those are also similar, the, the same states that we have failed to invest in from an infrastructure uh, ca capacity building level um, as well. Um, so we have to be really honest with ourselves um, about why that exists, um, as well as how are we going to support um, the groups and the people 
uh, in those states to be able to run these initiatives. We're actually seeing more state legislatively referred ballot measures now than we are actually seeing citizen initiated um, ballot measures. State legislatures are Louisiana that Desmond mentioned was a very good example of um, taking um, um, a, a Jim Crow law essentially out um, uh, of the state constitution. Um, and we're seeing this more and more. It, we saw, we saw it a lot in, in 2018 and 2020. Um, so if we are going to do this, if we're gonna liberate the tool, then we also have to make the investments in the communities, the people and the groups to what Desmond was talking about, the impacted communities, to actually be able to use the tool itself. And that's what we really believe in at BISC. You know, we believe in investing in folks like Desmond. We were there from the beginning, right, Desmond? Writing things on nap napkins, right? Like that we believe that that is fundamentally how we have to, how we have to shift. Um, you know, process-wise, it's going to take an amendment to your state constitution, right? As some states, it's going to, it'll be in two consecutive sessions like a Georgia. Um, but to the piece on what we are seeing now on the attacks of the ballot measure process is exactly in a direct result of what we've been able to do pretty much since 2016 to pass these measures. I mean, things like in Florida, immediately at the year after Amendment 4 was passed, they introduced a piece of legislation that you would have to pass an amendment by 65% of the vote, somehow just above one percentage point of what Amendment 4 passed. We're seeing this in state after state. As the people are using this tool to determine what they want for their lives, we are seeing these attacks um, across the country. And there were three ballot measures in 2020 to undermine the process. Every single voter rejected those measures. So, I mean, this is a mobilizing um, a, a opportunity for all of us and a really great organizing tool, uh, especially thinking about the states where we don't have it yet. I'm not sure if this is where to bring it in, but resources quite often are needed by these groups. And I've mentioned that several times that we wouldn't have gotten anywhere without partnerships from the democracy movement. And there is, um, I, I just learned today that Unite America uh, just launched a campaign accelerator awards and that, that can help fund ballot measures during, um, that, that, are, that might be getting started. Um, so I would say look into those through this was this came from represent us, but certainly is all the groups that would be doing this kind of grassroots work would be eligible. And I would just say ditto to what Chris said, because North Dakota ha had a ballot initiative put on by the legislature where and they that's the other part that ticks me off is that they don't need to go out and, and get signatures. They just pass their resolution and it goes on the ballot, but it was roundly defeated and I was pleased to see that. But again, this session, which is going on right now, uh, is, is, is trying to undermine the initiated measure process also. They just don't like hearing it from the grassroots. Uh, is that everybody who wanted to speak? I'm happy to, uh, your first question was just about like bringing folks together. Um, and I do, I had a similar, or we had a similar experience in Michigan, just like Desmond was kind of talking about, you start with a more general question. So for us, it was, are you happy with the state of politics? And pretty much anybody on the street was like, no, I'm not. And then we're like, do you want to do something about it? Now, they might have their own reasons, like they might blame Democrats, they might blame Republicans, whatever that is. But fundamentally, people feel like they're not being represented, they're not being heard. And so to start there, to then say like, okay, well, here's something we can do about it and, and inviting people into that process was really, really helpful. And actually taking the time to go to different communities and have conversations. And a lot of people think that that takes like so much more time than just a bunch of experts sitting in a room arguing with each other, but it really doesn't. It, it, it was a way to help build support and engagement for people, not only realizing that the way we do things could look differently, but also getting a different appreciation 
for what's in our constitution. It's an extremely powerful document that changes and impacts our lives immensely. And so by taking the time to go to people and have conversations, not only do education, but ask for their input in this process, it can, it, it, people are just even grateful for that experience. We had standing room only town halls um, across our state. Uh, our first one is in a, a population of 3000 and we had 77 people show up on a Saturday. You know, that was, it was amazing um, to see and it kept happening over and over again. And it was because people are so hungry to not just complain or not just watch TV and throw their hands up. Like they really do want our country to be better. Well, I just quick. Oh, go ahead, Desmond. Yeah, well, yeah, just quickly. I want to just touch on what Dina said. I think it's, I think we are in a better position now. Folks are in a better position in those states that are able to have ballot initiatives because uh, I know when I started, it was no one around, right? But BISC, right? And 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 as a matter of fact, Tova, you actually played a role because our organizers were using their 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 uh, bed sheets and painting logo from the arts from paint from an arts and craft store to actually table petition gathering events. And Tova, you actually stepped in and gave us a first bit of money to actually get our own uh, legitimate tablecloth with logos. Just to be clear, so not out when, of my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I had all the money in the but, world to keep the Desmond, but. <laughs> but, but. But, you know, when um, Dina talked about, like, the Campaign Accelerate Awards that folks can um, see, uh, find on the Represent Us website, now we have uh, so many organizations that are understanding the value of a ballot initiative that are providing resources for people like Katie and, and myself, right? And, and they're understanding, like Chris said, the importance of having directly impacted people at the center. And so they're helping to develop infrastructure uh, around these folks and to elevate these uh, directly impacted individuals. So we are in a much better place, right? And, and I, I just do believe that, that, that folks have to, if, if, they, if they have that opportunity to take advantage of it, because that window will be closing you know, as more and more uh, politicians, notice I said politicians and not public servants, are threatened, right, by we the people. Okay, um, if that's for that. For that um, I, so a lot of people are asking in one way or another, what's next? And I, I just in case Desmond is going to not be able to go past five o'clock, I just want to um, call you out and and a lot of people are asking what the future is for the implementation of amendment four and what you've been able to do so far so i know it's a long story but Listen, if you can give us the elevator version i guess every day is the season uh, well we we can't just think in cycles or election cycles we understand like like this less we're less of a campaign and more of a movement as dina says we are a movement 24 hours a day seven days a week so we have to continue to register, folks. We, you know, we know that our state legislature in, uh, 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 created a law that uh, that mandated that people pay outstanding legal financial obligations, and we just have to keep pressing through. We raised over twenty-seven million dollars last year. We're continuing to raise money, but we're also going to use courts to uh, uh, waive these fines and fees and still continue to register people in the midst of a pandemic. Do not let the overarching or the top national results uh, from the state of Florida disappoint or discourage you because there were so many great things that happened in Florida, right? And we had over like, I believe a hundred thousand returning citizens participate in elections. And, and we had their family members and relatives who lived in the households who never registered before, register to vote and vote in elections and elect new state attorneys or district attorneys and sheriffs and, and judges. And so there's been a significant impact uh, not only in the state of Florida, but communities are, are around the country, right? That's being spurned on by the increased uh, 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 involvement of young people, returning citizens and first time voters. There's a lot to celebrate right about what happened in 2020 and that can con that celebration can continue if we do not let our foot off the gas and that means that we're registering people to vote now and we're fighting 
to have conversations with even people that don't look like us and may not think like us, but we're going to have conversations with those individuals, right? And talk about how critical it is that they participate in our democracy. I want to actually just quickly intervene here because the question got asked some time ago. Many people who are listening would like to get in touch with each of you. And Kara, you did put your email address into the chat room, but for the other four panelists, if you're willing to put your email in the chat room so people can contact you directly, that would be fantastic. I'm actually gonna pick up one question that I saw, Tova, if you don't mind, because I, th I think it reflects a really difficult challenge in our country now. Lynn Brown said, these stories are utterly inspiring but how do we get the national media to cover them? She watches media, she does cable, she, but rarely hears something like this. This is a real problem in our culture. There's so much positive happening around the country, state, local, that the rest of us never hear about. So I'm gonna ask two questions of the panelists. If in your story, you had some examples of how it did break through significantly in media, at least for a period of time to share that story. And then if any of you or all of you have ideas about how to get this positive work for our democracy into the national media, now would be a great time to share it with the people who are listening. Well, I never made it to the Ellen DeGeneres show and I really wanted that. <laughs> but we, we, we did get included in books and we were interviewed on a podcast in Canada on women who have done things like this, including Abuela's on the borders and that sort of thing. So we were proud of that. But there's, a, there's gotta be a hook. And Katie, you have done an amazing job on getting national. <laughs> I think that's, you're the, you're the expert. Yeah, happy, happy to jump in. I think that for our story in particular in Michigan, because I made a Facebook post and was 27, that was just like a really snappy headline. Um, but the other part of what we did, which I'd also say is the best practice, is we tried to take every step of the process and celebrate our democracy. So there's some things that if you do ballot initiatives all of the time, you'd be like, oh, you're going to the Board of Canvassers meeting. Like, that's just a process step. Well, for us, a bunch of us had no idea who the heck the board of canvassers were. And we were all working at putting this ballot initiative on our state ballot. So when we were on the um, the meeting agenda, I said, well, we're going to be bringing like 600 people. And they were like, what? So, like our room can hold 30. And we're like, well, we all are the public and we're interested. So we, our state legislature actually had to rent a conference room for our volunteers to show up to celebrate that we had actually just written, like we hadn't even gathered signatures yet. This was like literally just getting approved to be able to start gathering signatures. But it was a celebration because we had written constitutional language. We had navigated the process so far successfully, even though people had to try to deter us. And those personal interest stories, like talking about and making that exciting, really helped even the local journalists have to cover these issues in a different way. A lot of state level um, media, not to any fault of their own, but they look at politics as like a game. They're like, well, here's the Democrat score and here's the Republican score and da, da, da. And it's like, no, no, when we're talking about redistricting, we're talking about communities. We're talking about do people have access to clean water? Do they have their school district being represented and they have to talk to one representative or five because they've been gerrymandered that way? And we also took that into account with like our volunteers. We had examples of how this issue was going to impact people in every single part of our state. And so whenever we talk to local media, I was making sure one of our volunteers who are actually from that community were talking about how this would be impacting them and in their community community. On the national end, part of why I started The People was to actually try and do this more. Um, I happened to be able to meet a lot of the other people working on redistricting in 2018. There are actually five ballot initiatives that passed, which is really, really exciting. But it was work to make the journalists understand that this is a movement, that actually it's, yes, our story in Michigan is great, but actually there's citizens in red, blue, purple states all caring about this. This isn't just like one Facebook post, this is a bunch of them. Um, and so we've continued to do that over the last year, trying to find what are the similar themes and then how can we pull together national press to hopefully write a story about this. One of the tactics that worked and I think represent us does this really well, but 
thankfully, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is really into fair redistricting. And so when I could pull him onto a call, I got a lot more national journalists who are really excited to be able to interview Arnold Schwarzenegger. And the really great part I'll just say about him is he makes it all about the people actually doing the campaigns. He really is doing this because he believes voters should be choosing their politicians, not the other way around. But unfortunately, when he isn't on those national media calls, it is hard to cut through the noise. Um, I think showing interest and letting your media know that you are interested in topics like this in Michigan, there was this, the Michigan Public Radio, they did a, a poll to their members asking them what they wanted to hear more stories about. While our campaign was up, redistricting was number one for two years, where people just said, I want to know more, I want to know more, I want to know more. Uh, how much have I got left, Carolyn? One question, two questions. <laughs> uh, do one more question, and then I want to leave time for each of the panelists to make a real closing statement. So okay, just well, take one more, Tova. All right, so, so okay, kind of two. <laughs> No, 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 just one, just one. Well, I'll just, I'll say that there were a couple of different questions sort of related to what you're talking about and, and being really happy that Desmond brought up all the great things that happen even as it's been a challenge and this idea of celebrating wins. So people have been asking about what are some fun ways to get involved that are not just donating money? What are the different kinds of activities people um, respond to in that respect? And then, um, I was going to just ask Chris in particular, but anybody, what is um, happening on the horizon around ballot initiatives going forward in this area? And then we'll have uh, closing comments by the panelists. So there are three major, major trends that we're seeing. Um, one, revenue, revenue, revenue. State budgets have shortfalls. We are in the middle of state legislative sessions. We will have budget shortfalls. That, that means so funding for schools, public housing, a number of things. And that is something that we are looking at as a trend um, for 2022. There will be, we're looking at least six to eight statewide ballot measures on revenue. Democracy, what we're talking about right now. At least two to three states will have um, statewide um, ballot measures on democracy reform. Actually, two states that unfortunately, because of COVID and the signature gathering requirements, um, didn't make it to the ballot in 2020 in Arizona and Ohio. They're working really hard. Um, and that coalition was already built, right? So they just have been able to 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 be able to build for for 2022 and uh, reforming the criminal legal system or restorative justice. Um, I, I want to be very clear. Um, it, la last year, 19 of 20 of the local ballot measures on policing, they passed. Wow. So the national narrative that the defund the police and what the movement for Black lives is doing is, is detrimental and harmful, it's just not true. That's not how it's playing out actually in local communities. Um, and there is a huge um, desire to um, do restorative justice and take out a really um, problematic laws around um, mass incarceration, abolition of slavery as a form of uh, um, punishment that is still in the United States Constitution and 13, uh, 12 state, well now 11 state constitutions. There's huge movement around that. Um, so those are a, a couple of the trends that we're seeing. Um, uh, um, uh, on the rise and anything with revenue related, uh, related to economic justice. So paid family leave, raising the minimum wage um, are, are the major trends we're seeing. Are any one of you actually working on or plan to work on another citizen ballot initiative either in 2022 or beyond? Helping support about eight of them um, through just best practices and how do we assist people. There's a lot of things like rank choice voting, open primaries, um, and a lot of local levels too. Something I wanted to mention earlier is even if your state doesn't have a statewide ballot initiative, your city may, and it most likely does, or maybe even your county. And there's a lot of change that can start there. And oftentimes too, if this is kind of a newer idea or concept, I, I think this is right, Kara, but please correct me if I'm wrong, but for rank choice voting as an example, Passing it at the city level so people get comfortable with a brand new way of doing democracy can be a great way to make it have a better chance of success at the state level when you get a chance to push that on. Or it helps legislators see, oh, this isn't as partisan as I thought it was. Like, maybe we do want to actually adopt this or bring this up, or it seems like a lot of our constituents like this. Yeah, for sure, Katie. Um, in, in Maine, 
the city of Portland, Maine had adopted uh, ranked choice voting. And when I first started working on it, I thought, well, this is really helpful, right? Because you've got the largest city in Maine where the voters are already using RCV. And then it was also really great because they were using it without, a, without there being any problems. So they were able to, to, to implement and have an election and not have any problems. And so I was able to point to that. And it was, it was very helpful when people would say, well, nobody's gonna be able to understand this. I would say, well, if they can understand it in Portland, then certainly they can understand it in, in Bangor. So yes, um, I think it's, it's ranked choice voting at the local level is a great place for people to, um, to, to start. So Tova, I wanna to thank you for managing questions. I know because I've also been watching, there are a lot of questions that we didn't get to. And I apologize for all of us to those uh, people who didn't get responded to. We knew Desmond had to leave right at five, but I want to give each of the panelists at this point a moment to just take a breath. And what's the last message that you would like to send to everyone who's joined us? And then I'll have a closing comment as well. Well, maybe age before all of you beauties, but um, I would say that one of the most inspirational things that happened uh, in the beginning of this, this tour trip that we took was going to an unrig uh, event where all of the democracy groups were, I, I think, or maybe not all the democracy groups were, were there, but I just was not aware that there was so much lift to be given to local and state initiatives from so many wonderful resources. And uh, that, that really gave me joy. And then the next year to be on stage with some of, with Katie and with Desmond and other wonderful leaders who had done, I, I had no idea we could do that in a year, you know, from takeoff to, to, to landing. Um, so get involved on the national level with partners that are, are great and resources that can be made available. Um, that, that would be my, my closing. And just knowing that it was a great ride. I'm not sure if I have another initiated measure um, in my retirement now, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not totally saying no yet. Thank you very much, Dina. And I have a suspicion we'll hear from you again. Kara, are you willing to speak next? Sure. Um, thanks, Caroline. Uh, I just wanted to close by saying that citizen democracy is one of the very greatest gifts that our American ancestors have bequeathed to us. And I think that they did this because they trusted us to love our democracy as much as they did. And every single time that I'd get discouraged in the battle, I would just remind myself that a hundred years ago or that you know, the constitution was amended, that they amended it for us. They amended it to give us power, to give us agency, to give us another reason to engage in and be devoted to and to believe in our, in our democracy. Um, and thank you so much for having us here. What a great, what a great opportunity this is to, to talk about citizen ballot initiatives. Thanks, Kara. Katie, I'm gonna call on you next and then Chris, you'll have the last word. Sure, sounds good. This is um, one comment I had from a little earlier that I wanted to just not forget. Um, one of the really great parts about what happened in Michigan is Voters Not Politicians, I think last week actually just helped um, introduce a bill with the legislature to add transparency and accountability to our system in Michigan because thousands of people got involved and took their time, their energy, their money, their persistence, they followed every single step of the way. The legislature didn't want us to go and make a ballot measure again. They would rather actually be a part of the decision-making process and what that bill looks like for introducing something. And that was introduced with bipartisan support. Michigan is ranked, I think like 50th or 49th when it comes to ethics and transparency. We are literally one of the worst states. And to see that because of the power of citizens and that network staying engaged, people wanting to continue to be involved because now they actually know how to navigate that process, it has had ripple effects. We also had 17 people decide to run for office afterwards, people who had never been involved politically besides voting before, because they saw that the stories in their head for all the excuses for why I can't or why I shouldn't or why it will be too hard 
actually weren't as strong as all the people were telling them to. A lot of people telling them to because they like the status quo or they benefit from the status quo. We also had several ballot initiatives start afterwards that way too. When you get involved to use something, a tool on how to actually try and change the system, it creates a ripple effect where other people can now see that things are possible, that they can bring change. And that has been like one of the most powerful experiences. We were really lucky to have our story featured in, in a documentary called Slay the Dragon. It's on Hulu, if you have Hulu. But, but what's been really cool about that is there are so many people who just feel helpless. They feel like, I know I want to do something, but I have no idea where to start or how to start that. And people on this call can all help people get connected that way, especially Chris Melody and me at the people as well, like with our, uh, no matter what state you're in, if it's a democracy issue, we're happy to help. Um, but even just showing that it's possible, showing that actually there's more we have in common, I think that's one of the most important things I've walked away with. And that any way you can get involved in a ballot initiative process or, or direct democracy in general, showing up to your city council meetings, all of those things, I think you'll... Um, volunteering, gathering signatures. Uh, for me as a millennial who's very comfortable behind a screen and less with in-person conversation, thought I would have been terrified from gathering signatures. It was one of the best things I've ever done. I actually got to talk to people about real issues and realize I wasn't alone, that I wasn't just some genius who was like, why don't we fix the system? There were actually so many people who genuinely feel that way. And we, we all of us on spending our Thursday evening wanting to talk about ballot initiatives and democracy, you know, we aren't alone either. Thanks, Katie. Chris. We are in a moment of radical reimagination. It is happening. It's not something in the future, it's happening right now. And we all have a huge part in, in radically reimagining our democracy. It's not something passive. It's not something that, you know, you vote for someone and then you're done, right? This is continuous and it is, it is we are building and shifting power in real time right now. And every single one of us has an incredibly important role in this radical reimagination. Just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean it isn't possible. And we, everybody on this panel is like an example of that, that possibility if you just believe um, and, and have somebody else believing you. And that's so incredibly important when you think about ballot initiatives. And it's not just about the win, it's the long-term trajectory. Um, and just because you win doesn't mean it's done, right? The final thing I'll say, and I think I did it in the chat the right time, the right time because I realized I emailed just the panelists. Um, BISC um, has an annual conference, usually in Vegas. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we, we weren't able to do it uh, in Vegas. Um, but it is April 1st and 2nd, the afternoons of those. We're doing it free because we actually want to make sure that this is more accessible um, to folks. So. I think I dropped it in. If you want to learn more about even more amazing people that are doing totally badass grandma-like things across the country, um, I absolutely invite you to join. Thank you, Chris. Well, a big thank you to the Ash Center and to the Center for Public Leadership for sponsoring this panel. A huge thank you to the panelists. A huge thank you to all who joined us. And I'm just going to refocus us for a moment on how fragile we have learned our democracy is in the past recent history. Mm -hmm. And that now is a moment that each one of us, each, every one, can take a step to rebuild trust with each other and with our democracy. And I'm gonna just support what other people have said if you're someone who wants to do this, but you just haven't quite had what it takes to take the first step, think of someone in your life that you trust the most and go talk to them about the step you want to take. And then a year from now, we'll see you on this panel. Thank you. <laughs>